Okay, it's a pleasure for me to uh, announce a talk about a topic that I'm personally very interested in. That's uh, uh, how you uh, give life uh, back to uh, a staple in telecommunication technology, the good old rotary phone. And today we have uh, Hans Gilke here. Uh, he's a researcher for embedded computer systems in Zurich and he's going to tell us uh, how to revive these marvelous machines. Hans, take it away. Good afternoon. Thanks for inviting me. I'm very honest, honored to be here and honest also. Um, yes, let me start with a personal story. When I was like 16 years brought me uh, two old post office phones and a relay switch. And I was so excited playing with those phones um, that this kept uh, through all my career, even so I'm doing embedded computing now. And then my father told me this story about Philip Rice. He said, you know, Philip Rice was the inventor of the telephone, even so some people think it's Bell, Alexander Graham Bell. And um, let me tell you a bit about this Philip Rice. When he... Um, when he demonstrated his telephone to the audience, he used two sentences. The first sentence was, the horse doesn't eat cucumber salad. And the second was, the sun is out of copper. And uh, then on the, the, let's look at how Philip Rice's telephone looks like. It's here. And what he used is, he used a knitting na uh, uh, needle. And around the knitting needle, he wound a uh, a uh, wire, a coil, and then here he had a battery, and here he had a microphone. You have to know that at this time microphones were not invented yet, there was no radio. And his microphone worked in a way, um, it had a contact on a membrane, and the contact touched the membrane and it vibrated up and down. So basically his first transition was digital because only current on, current off. And you can imagine how well this sounds through this knitting needle. And so he needed, only certain people could understand. So the first um, uh, transmission, the people that listened to the transmission understood only the horse eats, instead of the horse eats, eat, doesn't eat cucumber salad. And the other one, they understood the sun is out of sugar. <laughs> So you can imagine that this is not a commercial product, and so he, it was not a commercial success. Um, but it got a lot of uh, attention. So one day, uh, Graham Bell heard about it and got a kit of this uh, system and re, um, re, uh, re improved it. And uh, this was also not a commercial success. Then he, but he was clever enough to patent it and uh, Standard Telegraph, a telegraph company in the United States, bought the patent and developed the microphone, improved the microphone. And then, because it was a telegraph company, they didn't see a um, commercial success either, so Graham Bell bought it back, and the rest of the story we know. Uh, going back to my father, um, this is a my small telephone collection at home. I found these telephones my father gave me in the basement when I cleaned up, and I thought, hmm, it's really bad. I would like to do something with it. But maybe as you know, even if you connect a rotary phone to a Fritz box, it's not working anymore because the Fritz box sends strange signs, pound, and uh, to, to connect. So I had to invent something to make that possible. At the same time, I'm teaching uh, Yocto Linux. I prepared for a Yocto Linux class with my, uh, a Raspberry Pi. I thought, why not building a telephone central switch with it? And, that, and then my idea for this project was born. So what I want to do is, first of all, let's go back. Um, my telephone switch, the, what I wanted to do was, I wanted to connect at least eight telephones. And I want to connect, wanted to connect through the outside line through a router so that I could impress my friends when they come with their mobile phones. I could call them on the mobile phones from my rotary dial phones and vice versa, they could call my rotary dial phones from their mobile phones. So that was the uh, 
uh, the yeah, this was my these were my goals. And uh, today I want to tell you in order how to achieve that, I want to first give you a quick introduction in analog phones, how analog phones work, then uh, the interface to the Raspberry Pi, and then what the software I implemented on the Raspberry Pi. So since a uh, hundred years, the analog phones look about all the same. If it's US telephone or German telephone, they are all about the same, except some uh, some uh, parameters are a bit different. So what you have here is, you have here the bell. The bell is just a solenoid, and it has a clapper, and the solenoid is tuned to a frequency of 20 to 25 hertz, and it needs a very high current. In Germany, it's not that high, it's maybe 75 volts. In the US, it's very high, it's about 100 volts. So it needs about 100 volt RMS, and 25, 20 to 25 hertz, that, so that it works at all. And then there is um, a, a hook switch. This is when you lift the receiver. I always, in my presentation, I always say uh, off hook on on hook. Then there's a carbon mic. This is the mic microphone they improved uh, at standard. Uh, uh, standard telegraph, it's basically uh, charcoal, and its charcoal is compressed, and when it's compressed more, the resistance is, is lower, and if it's not so much compressed, the resistance is higher, so it, there's a uh, AC, a, a low frequency voltage uh, modulated on this line. So when the telephone is off hook, this hook switch is opened, there's a, a voltage of 80 volt DC on the lines A and B of the phone. And then when the hook switch is closed, a current is flowing through a transformer here, through our carbon mic, and out here. And as you know, through the microphone here, the NF voltage, low frequency voltage is modulated onto here. There's another circuit they found out when you have the when people phone, then they hear themselves in the in the ear, and then the people start uh, talking uh, lower with a lower voice. So they figured out if they stop that, then people talk louder. So there's another cir little circuit built in here, and it's a coil on the same bobbin as this transformer here, and it's wound in the other direction. So the current from the carbon microphone flows like in this direction through this coil and in this direction through this coil and then it compensates. So what happens, what you speak in here, you don't hear in here. It's called side tone cancellation. Good, and then there's another invention uh, from an American. He had a mortgage, a <laughs> not mortgage, a uh, funeral parlor. And uh, when the um, telephonist in the village changed, when she got pensioned, all of a sudden he didn't, didn't get contracts anymore. And he wondered why. It's because the new telephonist connected to the competition funeral parlor. So his idea was, I, we need something that the people can dial their own number and are not dependent on the telephonist. So this person, developed the rotary dial. So there is another contact. And like, for example, when you dial a three, then this loop current here opens and closes and opens and closes three times. And on the other hand is a mechanical device that counts the pulses and makes the connections. So I think we got now all components of that phone. And then uh, after breadboarding, I implemented this on the PCB, and you see a lot of wires there because it's still experimental. It didn't work. I'm not a very good analog designer, so it didn't work the first shot the way I wanted, but now it works pretty well. And here's a block diagram of what you, what you find here. You have um, a front-end circuit, and the front-end circuit is responsible for the ringing. So I have here a generator that generates my 100 volt, 25 hertz ringing voltage. 
And in the front end is a relay that depending on which phone is ringing, the relay connects to the phone. And if the relay is not, if the telephone is not ringing, if you're speaking, the relay connects to a circuit I call the splitter. Then the splitter splits on, on the phone. You have a full duplex signal, both directions. For, uh, and it splits up this full duplex uh, signal in a receive audio signal and a transmit audio signal. And then for the external line, I have a circuit here. This one you could, for example, co connect to a Fritz box. And then you have here a receive, the same way a receive and transmit signal. And now I have to control how the fo uh, phones are connected to each other. I have a connection matrix. I build it out of J fat transistors and I needed 32 for only one level, so it's not a good idea. Later I found out there's a chip to do that. Maybe in the next version I do with a chip. So for example, if number six wants to talk to number whatever, seven, if this is seven, then this, the J fat connects this. Uh, lines here, or it connects these lines back here. So back there is the Raspberry Pi, and the Raspberry Pi controls this connection matrix, and it uh, gets the loop signals if the, the receiver is off or on, on hook. It controls which phone is going to ring, and there's another circuit I explain in a moment. It's called the ring trip. For the external connections, I have the ring detector, which detects if someone calls from the outside. So let's look a bit closer into this front end. So the front end uh, is supplied with um, 32 two to 100 volt for the ringing voltage. And now I, what ha would happen if the phone rings, you have an AC on the phone line and you lift the receiver. Then you would hear a very now loud 25 hertz sound and maybe it damages your phone. So you want to avoid that. So in there is a circuit that detects this and generates a signal that goes to the Raspberry Pi called ring trip. The, the ring trip stops the connection. And the splitter provides the loop voltage, and it provides a signal to the Raspberry Pi loop close. That means if you hang up the receiver, it's open, it's on, and when you uh, uh, put the receiver on the fork, it's off. And here are the audio signals splitter in and splitter out. So this uh, ringing signal looks like that, where you, I generate the ring voltage. It took me, I, I, am not, I didn't work on this, pro, I worked for this, on this project for maybe five, six years, and I don't have all the time to work on this project. So for about two week, years, I developed this uh, circuitry here to generate this 20 to 25 uh, hertz voltage. And it's a very, actually, in the end, I had a solution which is very simple. I'm using a bridge chip, just like people that build um, uh, mo uh, cars with Raspberry Pi. They need a bridge chip to control the motors, and it's about the same thing. But the output is not high enough, so I, I had a little transformer manufactured that gets the voltage up to 100 volt. And here's my ring trip circuit. The one side is connected to the DC voltage, and if someone lifts the receiver, there's a, a current flowing through the ring trip, and the ring trip detects, ah, someone lifted the receiver, and then kicks this relay so that it's going, the telephone is connected to the splitter. The splitter is when you have a normal call. By the way, this bridge, is called to the pulse, connected to the pulse width modulator output of the, of the Raspberry Pi and how PVM works, I think maybe most people know. Good, then the splitter circuit, so that's basically uh, the uh, part that uh, splits the full duplex audio signal in, two, in receive and transmit. The most important is here, it's the DC detector it generates a signal called loop closed, and if I lift the receiver, the loop closed signal indicates that someone lifts the receiver. And um, everything that's coming in the f uh, through the phone, so if I speak in the speaker of the phone, it's coming out here 
it split her out. And if I want to feed audio in the phone, the audio that feeds the phone goes in here and goes here in the phone. There's a problem with that, because if I drive a signal in here, it's also arriving here. It's a, the same problem that you have when you speak in your microphone of your receiver, you hear yourself. So I built here an electronic circuit that cancels the so-called side tone. So I have here a second pass that goes here to a differentiator, and the differentiator subtracts the signal coming in here and the signal from the phone, both signals going out of the, from the microphone on the phone. And the result is, uh, on the splitter out, you have only the, um, the signal that's going here in through the phone. So it splits these two signals in two. Good, now let's, let's talk about the software. Um, so uh, this is an, um, basically software that has to control an analog system where a lot of things are going on at the same time. For example, a party is calling and a third party is dialing in from the external line. Or I have to generate, I'm dialing a number and I have to generate tones. So all these things are happening at the same time. So I divided the whole thing in real-time tasks. So I have lots of tasks that are running at the same time. Let's look, and I'm using round-robin scheduling for that. So let's look at the main finite state machine. For each connection or each phone, you need one main finite state machine. I implemented right now only one connection. So my switch can make only one connection because I didn't implement the switch matrix uh, fully. I had 32, 32 JFATs, so I calculated for all four connections I needed like 256 JFATs and it's too much for demonstration. So I have only one main finite state machine. And the main finite state machine monitors my loop closed signal. And once you lift the receiver, I send a conditional signal to the rotary thread. So the rotary thread counts the pulses of the rotary dial. So that's actually the m most important thing is the rotary thread that counts the pulses. So I send a, a signal and then the rotary waits for the pulses. And once all the pulses came in, it sends back to my main state machine, this is, dial is complete. If I need to generate signals, for example, um, for, the, for the ringing tone or whatever, I have here a semaphore that sends, goes to a thread that's responsible for generating signals. For example, the nice thing is like the English sound. I can try that. So you have like a ring cadence. What I didn't say before is that I wanted to get the international feeling of my phones. So you have seen on my collection, I have some phones from the UK, I have some US phones, I have German phones, I have French phones and so on. And I wanted to have the look and feeling of those phones. When you lift the English phone, you get the dial tone from the English phone. And when you dial the, uh, call someone on the English phone, it should ring like what you just heard. So this is done with... <laughs> So this is done with generate signals. And then I'm using GStreamer for generating those sounds. And one is, for example, for the ringing tones. And then um, I have to dial also outside. So the Fritz box understands only DTMF signals. It doesn't understand pulses anymore. So with GStreamer, I build a DTMF generator. And I also can play special announcements. Let's see if that works. For example, a lot of Germans, when they are Older, they know that. <laughs> so this, all this is done with GStreamer. Good, what else do we have? Yeah, I have a, a, another task for the pulse width modulation of the ring signal. Good, and the main state machine so basically for each connection I need a main state machine. So when nobody calls, it's in idle. 
and if someone gets off hook, the main state machine uh, goes into the off hook state and here it waits for the dial pulses and I des designed it so I have two digit numbers. After the first number came in, it waits for the second number and when the a rotary dial response, uh, it goes to state internal ringing and then it depends also if you, for example, um, uh, have uh, uh, want to connect to the outside line. So I have to, have, well, when it, once it detects I dialed a zero, it uh, goes to the state outside line and it connects to the outside, to the Fritz box. Or if the number doesn't exist at all, for example, 98 or something, I don't have so many phones yet. <laughs> so uh, it comes the unobtainable sign, so the number, what you just heard, is not available. Or if someone is busy on the phone, it gets engaged. And on the external side, like for example, if someone calls from the external, uh, the system waits uh, until someone responds and then the external uh, uh, connection is established. So let's go in the important things. For example, so how do I do this? How do I count pulses from the rotary dial? When my receiver is on the hook, there's no current, no loop current. So what I do here is I de detect the loop current here. So there's, um, so the loop current is zero. Now someone lifts the receiver, the loop current goes on, and uh, after a while the, the person decides to dial a number. So for the amount of uh, the rotary dial runs, the pulses go here up and down. So here I generate three pulses, which is equivalent to the number three. Once the um, rotary dial is finished, there you see there's no more pulses coming, so the software is detecting that and sends a signal to the main state machine, dial complete. So a three was dialed, dial is complete. And then if I hang up, I'm, I'm completed with my phone call, I hang up, the loop current goes low again. So how did I manage this? Um, I'm using the select system of the uh, uh, of the Linux. So what you can do is you can take a GPIO signal and on the GPIO signal you can enable the interrupts, for example rising and falling. I enabled both edges, rising and falling. And then uh, you can set the file descriptor to your exception. So when a pulse comes on the GPIO, an exception is generated. And you can also set a uh, timeout. So what this select instruction does, actually, it, if you insert this in your C code, it waits at that time and it blocks your, your thread. It blocks your thread until uh, something happens, until a condition uh, happens, for example, an exception. And then the select functions blocks your thread and until uh, for example, there's a timeout. So if you have a timeout, it's dangerous to block a third forever. So if you have a timeout, it returns a zero. If, uh, if, it's not, if you don't have a timeout, if it's, everything is okay, so it, re it, it uh, returns something larger than zero, a number larger than zero, than zero, or if they are failure, it returns a minus one. So I, I built this in this... Uh, uh, select functions inside. And then I have another little uh, state machine here that when nobody's dialing, it's in idle. And now I lift my receiver the, through a, a conditional wait. The state machine is started and it waits now for the pulses. And at the first select statement, I put the time out to 30 seconds. So if someone lifts the receiver and doesn't do anything, after 30 seconds, he gets a message that he should dial or hang up. <laughs> in the US, it's, very, it's not very nice. And yes, in the US, you hear like first a nice announcement and then you have a real harsh sound to hang up the receiver. So that's actually I do with the select and the timeout condition. So let someone, let's assume someone lifts the receiver, dials a number. So one pulse is about 100 milliseconds, one dial pulse. After about 80 milliseconds, it um, gets a timeout 
if, if, if the pulse is then, uh, lower for more than 80 milliseconds, it gets a timeout, and the state machine goes back in the idle mode and said, the user hang up. So it could be that you lift the receiver and then you hang up again so that it gets the message to who's hanging up. But if everything is okay, then the state machine uh, uh, sets a number counter to one and then goes to closed. And while it goes to closed, it increments the number. So in, while the pulses come in, the state machine flips back and forth between these two states and counts the number. Now finally, the number is counted then the signal will stay, the loop current will stay high again, and then um, this must, uh, the timeout will be reached because it's longer than 80 milliseconds, and then I go back to the idle mode, and I send a status dial complete, and then I, with dial complete, I will read out the number and know how many numbers I counted. So I use this select statements with timeout to figure out what's going on, and when the dial is completed, or if someone hang up, after well, it doesn't dial. Good, so this is the counting for the rotary pulses. Then um, um, I need to generate uh, DTMF pulses for connecting to the Fritz box. So DTMF pulses, or maybe you know them, I can play it. Okay, now I hope it stops again. <laughs> um, and the DTMF pulses, they use two frequencies. So each button is assigned to two different frequencies. And I'm using those DTMF pulses with a software called, uh, or a package called GStreamer that I installed on the Yocto. And GStreamer is a, a framework, and uh, uh, you can build uh, uh, up a pipeline and uh, out of components, out of plug-in plugins. For example, there are plugins available for MP3 decoder. Then there is um, file reader. So what you heard is coming from a file that I recorded off the internet. And there's uh, also outputs, sinks, and sources. So if I uh, s uh, send it out to the Raspberry Pi, I'm, use I'm going here through an ALSA sync. And there's some tool to for debugging. And then also you can uh, get also complete video editors and things like that. So to build up a pipeline, uh, I used two sources. I used the audio test source. It's called audio test source. It's the, the source for the whole thing. And I'm using the adder to, two, to mix the two sounds together. So I'm using here an adder. And so, so that this works, I have to put it in a queue. So I put both audio signals into a queue. And then I have to attach a manual pad to get this out and uh, another pad to get it back into the adder. And to adapt to the sync I have, I'm, I'm using the analog audio output of the Raspberry Pi for that. Uh, I have also implemented, which I have not shown, I have also implemented a codec for that, but uh, it's the easiest way is to use the analog audio output. So the ALSA sync is the analog audio output. And in order to get there, I have to convert my audio and resample it to this sync. And with those things, I can generate the DTMF pulses. By the way, what is very interesting, at first it didn't work. And I figured uh, my, my Fritz box couldn't understand the DTMF pulses. And I looked with a scope, I looked what it came out. And it's actually GStreamer, the frequency is slightly off. It's not, it's not within the tolerance of the DTMF. So by manually, by hand, I corrected the GStreamer, the audio frequency of the GStreamers. So I use it for DTMF and I use it also to generate the uh, dial tones. For example, in Germany, it's 425 hertz. And uh, in Germany, it's easy, all engaged, it's all the same frequency. 
In England, you have kind of a mixture of 350 hertz and 450 hertz. And in the US, it's very similar to that. Good. Um, yeah, I'm pretty much advanced. It's uh, faster than I thought. <laughs> um, so after I built this project, uh, by the way, the software you can find on the GitHub. Um, my programming skills, maybe don't blame me for my programming skills, please. <laughs> and uh, I can, if you want, I can load also the schematics on it, but I would be careful uh, with some caution. So what I would improve is, uh, right now I use JFAT for the connection matrix and uh, I2C to uh, parallel out uh, I2C expander chip. And um, later I found out there's a very convenient chip where you can do that all in one. And uh, all, you can also do all connections, you can all four phones con talk to all the other four phones at the same time, that I can't do right now. So I would use a chip to do that. Um, and then if you do that, you have to expand the main finite state machine, so it gets a bit complexer. You have to assign a state machine per connection or per phone. And also what be, would be very interesting is to use a cheaper Raspberry Pi. Um, it would be interesting to use a Raspberry Pi Nano, and maybe there are some people who want to program it not in C, but in MicroPython. And I, I didn't try it out, but it should work. It should be possible to do thread programming with MicroPython. And also the Raspberry Pi Nano also has a possibility to, to put audio out via the uh, I2S interface or even via the PulseWiz modulator. So it should be possible and it could be a next expansion of this project. And then also the splitter wasn't such an easy thing. Uh, splitting, so what I do is, the problem is on the splitter I take a um, full duplex signal and I split it into a receive and a transmit signal and on the other side I mix it again to a full duplex signal. And if the gain on this splitter is, is very high, I get an oscillation, I get a feedback between the two splitters. By the way, this uh, the damping or the separation of receive and transmit is very much dependent on the phone that's connected on the other side and the length of the wire or the, the properties of the wire. So if this is not, if this uh, splitter is not exactly ad adjusted, you can see on my splitter that there's an ad or you, uh, uh, adjustment potentiometer where you can set this exactly to zero. If this is not precise, you get like a feedback and so the all system swings with a very high frequency. So there's other possibilities uh, which I have seen, which I could explore, which would be maybe even better or better. Good, and then also the power consumption is a problem. I mean, the Raspberry Pi gets very hot and also my transformer gets very hot. I could improve it, put a, like a, maybe a switched power supply and also maybe uh, turn off a few uh, CPUs on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, because for, uh, like, I'd, I wouldn't want to have a system like that turned on 24 hours and consume a lot of power. So it should be possible to use it with, with, uh, uh, with a, a smaller Raspberry Pi, less processors. Yeah, so um, I thank you for listening. And uh, I could open, yeah, a question and answer session if you have some questions. To my design. Thank you, Hans, for the presentation and especially the work that you put in there. Really fascinating. Okay, you can line up at the microphones and I look at the signal agile first. Is there a question from the internet? There are a lot of questions from the internet, oh. and the internet was, was very nostalgic about the technology you were presenting, so there was a lot of interaction. One of the questions is, did you consider running a SIP to analog gateway on the Raspberry Pi? Yeah, I have heard about that this is possible. Um, that would be a possibility. I haven't maybe, no, I haven't done it yet, but it's, I, I, this would be a very elegant solution, yes. 
but I don't right now. I'm more the person that in, is in the hardware. But and also my problem is sometimes like um, I have um, maybe a few weeks to work on it, and then uh, I'm teaching, and I'm my time is absorbed in teaching, so I don't have all the time to develop it. I would la rather do that actually. <laughs> Okay, microphone two, please. Uh, yes, regarding hardware, um, it should be possible to turn this phone into a remote listening device by putting a much higher RF frequency to the bell current, and then you using the uh, resonant circuit of the phone as a uh, well, you get, you get the RF current through the microphone uh -huh. and then you modulate it uh, with your uh, uh, with your receiving circuit. And I think that should be possible with just software changes to your hardware. What is the uh, advantage of doing that? Why would you put uh uh, well, you can RF? then listen to the phone while the thing is still on the hook. <laughs> <laughs> it's a okay. very old hack, but I think with your hardware it should be possible to do that. Okay, maybe we should talk later about it. <laughs> okay, the internet, do we have another question? Yeah, a very electronic question. they asking if it's possible to power the Raspberry Pi with a rotary wheel by igniting uh, piezo sparks uh, with all the power, uh, but to power an SPI, the Raspberry Pi. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> good idea. So to power the Raspberry Pi with the power of the of the rotary phone. Yes. But then I, of course, mm, I doubt that there is enough power. Um, uh, but the idea was also to use a, a standard analog phone off the shelf, not to modify it. So I suppose if you want to power the whole thing, you need a generator in your, in your rotary phone, right? This is the idea behind it. And uh, so you, you can't do it with a standard rotary phone. Okay. But, but, but it's an interesting question because it's one professor at our institute is exactly doing things like that. So he's doing like light switches, remote controls that don't need batteries and things like that. Maybe I, should, I will suggest it to him when I'm back in Zurich. <laughs> Microphone three, please. Um, yeah, you have shown the use of the select function. Yeah. Um, is it something specific to Yocto? No. Uh -uh. That's general Linux, the select function. Okay, thank so you. It's not a Yocto thing. Yocto is a normal, Yocto is a release system. And so Yocto, it's called Yocto because it's a very, very small Linux. But everything, it's a standard, it's a standard Linux actually I'm using. And you can, like, the, on Yocto you have to add the packages as you need them. While, for example, if you have a, uh, Ubuntu Linux, you have like you load programs on the fly while your Ubuntu is uh, installed. On Yocto, you have to decide beforehand what kind of packages you need to get it very small. It doesn't have also a graphical user interface, but you could add one if you want. Okay, does this answer your question? Okay, okay the internet. Uh, there are a lot of people very interested in uh, participating in your project and uh, <laughs> working with you, and they're wondering if there is some kind of mailing list or a forum or some place to hang out uh, yeah. to discuss this technology. I haven't thought about it yet, but uh, could uh, arrange that, yes. I, I give you my, um, my, uh, or I pu my email, or I published my email address, so maybe if uh, the person who is interested could mail me and then I will tell, let him know if I installed that. What, what, what for me is very interesting also, like the, I tried to figure out how to do the analog circuit. And like I took, for example, a Fritz box apart because something like that must be built in the Fritz box because on the Fritz box you can connect three analog phones. But I didn't find a schematic or something. And I'm also in a telephone club in Switzerland. And there's, there's nobody who knows uh, how something like that works. They're all already, they are very old, so they know about relay technique and so on, even older than I. So, <laughs> but I didn't find anyone who knows how these input circuits work. And maybe I can find someone uh, who knows how this works, or maybe can get me a schematic or whatever. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, microphone two, please. Yeah, thanks for the awesome, awesome talk. Um, I'm curious to see it in action. Do you have any demonstration video? No, unfortunately not. Uh, I don't have a video. 
Um, but again, if this person sends me an email, I will prepare a video and show it. Thank you. Okay, quick question from microphone one, please. Uh, yeah, really, yes. thanks um, for sharing your experiences. I'm wondering, did you approach some telecommunication museums <laughs> with your project? I think it's deserving more than just your local network. Did I approach? Some museums, some telecommunication exhibitions who can uh, maybe use it for their phones. No, no. It's, it's, for now, it's uh, a completely private uh, work, and I always also, I only told it to friends of mine, and I didn't publish anything. And basically, the idea to come here was from another friend while we were jogging. He was saying, oh, the idea is something interesting for the Chaos Computer Conference. You should apply. <laughs> That's what I did. So it's, it's not public yet. So. Okay, since microphone three was very eager to take the spot from microphone one, I allow one more question from microphone one, but very quickly. Uh, did you ever um, connect a vintage modem, dial-up modem? Oh, <laughs> not yet, no. Uh -uh. But it should work because um, because it's the vintage. It, it's I. Uh, it, I should. I designed it as much as possible according to the specifications of the postal office. So a vintage modem should work, yes. Okay, great it. stuff. That was the last question that concludes this talk. And thanks again, Hans, for your presentation and your Thank work you. on World Reforms.